Hello and welcome again to another video from the parish of St. Anne. My name is Father Don Virus and I serve as the priest and pastor of the parish and I'm so delighted you're joining us again for our series on Anglicanism. Last, in the last video I spoke a bit about baptism and we're starting to go through the seven sacraments and as I mentioned there are two sacraments that we call sacraments of our Lord, or we use a fancy word known as dominical sacraments. These are sacraments that we believe that Jesus himself directly instituted, and we say that because we hear about them within the scriptures, within the gospels. And those sacraments, as I shared last week, are baptism and Holy Eucharist. They are also known as the sacraments of initiation, because by these sacraments, you and I become members of Christ's body, the church. We enter into a full and deep relationship with that body. And it might surprise you to hear that Eucharist is also a sacrament in, of initiation, but it is because that sacrament, our celebration and reception of Holy Communion, draws us more deeply into relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. So last week I spoke about baptism, this week I want to talk about Eucharist. Now Eucharist is actually an English word that comes from the Greek word for Eucharistica, simply mean to give thanks. Um, I'd have to verify if I said that right, so forgive me, we'll correct that later in the video. But Eucharist means to give thanks. It's a Greek word to say to give thanks. Interesting enough, in our church, we actually use it to refer to something else, and that is the bread and wine that is shared during the sacrament of Eucharist. So the word actually has a double meaning for us, but its primary meaning is to give thanks. And from the very earliest days of the Christian church, and we read about it in the Acts of the Apostles and in the letters of Paul, that from the very earliest days of the church, the Christian community gathered on what was known as the eighth day, or the day of the Lord, the day of the resurrection. Now, you're probably wondering, wait a minute, there's only seven days in the week, how can we have eight? Well, the early church understood eight as a sign of new life, new birth. And of course, all of them were Jewish at that time. And so the seventh day was actually the Sabbath. Now, the seventh day in the Jewish calendar would be, and still is, Saturday. And according to the scriptures, Jesus rose the day after the Sabbath, also known as the eighth day, the new day, new life. So the church, from the very beginning of the time, the apostles, the disciples, they all gathered together on Sunday to break bread and to hear the scriptures proclaimed. And this was their central act. It was the most important thing that they did in the week because they took serious Jesus' command at the Last Supper that they were to take bread and take wine and to do as he did, to give thanks and to remember that Christ gave himself to us to feed upon him and to be nourished by him. So the bread and wine was already understood to be very much the presence of Jesus Christ among the faith community. And the whole community gathered around the Eucharistic table. Initially, the Eucharist was celebrated in very smaller context. Uh, some scholars believe in house churches, although even though it was house churches, there was always a dedicated space by which the community would gather. It's somewhat of a misconception that they just simply had a banquet and then broke Eucharist. What often took place is they did share a major banquet, but then many archeological records, they actually proceeded to another room or to another place where they celebrated the Eucharistic meal, the banquet. Over time, as the church grew, the church began to occupy larger spaces, such as what we have here. And the Eucharist was then celebrated upon an altar, which we have one right behind me. And that altar was a place where the community gathered. Interestingly enough, for most of Christian history, and still in many places today, 
The priests face the same way as the people to the east, to Jerusalem, because we all looked and waited for Jesus coming again in glory. So during the Eucharistic celebration, the entire community gathered around the altar, looking towards the new Jerusalem, and offered their great hymn of praise and thanksgiving to God, the Eucharist. Over time, the Eucharist became rather rich in its celebration. If you are familiar with Christian Orthodoxy, you'll notice that the liturgy will be quite long and quite elaborate and quite right. But in every liturgical context, every celebration of the Eucharist, you have two things in common. You always have the proclamation of the word. So we always start off by reading the word of God and recalling God's saving work among us. This is actually, as I said last week, comes from our Jewish tradition. In the Jewish tradition, they always proclaim the word of God. They open up the scroll of the Torah and proclaim God's saving work among them, both in the past and in the present. And so do we as Christians. So we'll often have a reading from the Old Testament, a reading from one of the letters, and also a reading from the gospel. The second most important part, and one that you always see in every Eucharist, is the breaking of bread and the pouring of wine. And this is where we get the term Eucharist for referring to the elements themselves, bread and wine. And what we do when we celebrate Eucharist as a priest, what I do is I recall what Christ has done for us, and I say the words as Christ said them. Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body. Take this, all of you, and drink it, for this is my blood. That is a not just simply a reenactment or a remembrance, we believe that we are actually participating in the very gift that Jesus gives of himself. Now, a lot of people will rightly say, well, what do Anglicans actually believe about Jesus' presence in the Eucharist? And what we simply state, what's the basic understanding is that Christ is present in the bread and wine, his body and blood. And this is very clear when you read the Book of Common Prayer. For example, when the priest administers Holy Eucharist, he will always say, uh, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. That's always the first part of the prayer that the priest will say as he gives the bread to the communicant. What where we differ, say, from the Roman Catholic Church, is that we don't actually say that one must believe in a very technical term known as transubstantiation. And that was a very elaborate word that was used from the Middle Ages forward to sort of describe what happens to the bread and wine. Anglicans, as with many Reformed Christians and uh, in churches known as Protestant churches, what we largely say is, because Christ says it is so, we believe it is so. Now, there are some Ang Anglicans who do use the word transubstantiation. It's perfectly fine. If that's what one believes it to be so, then it is so. Uh, there are some Anglicans who will say it's just a symbol. Again, that's actually quite fine in the Anglican tradition. The Anglican tradition gives a fairly large room for how we describe this. But at the very basic core, we do believe that the bread and wine is the body and blood of Christ, that Christ is truly present to us in the sacrament. Uh, the Eucharist, final note that I wanna say here, the Eucharist, as I said earlier, is the most important act of the Christian church. The Eucharist is what makes the church and the Eucharist is what sustains the church. From the very earliest days of the Christian church, weekly participation in the Eucharist was seen as essential. Now granted, we in the Anglican Church don't say that there's a Sunday obligation because we want people to come on their own. We want you to make the initiative to come here. But if we wish to grow in the Christian life, if we wish to grow in holiness, if we wish to know God, to know Jesus, and to encounter Jesus, 
at the very basic, we must participate in weekly Eucharist. And I know that's hard for some people because we've become rather um, lax, so to say, or more comfortable in our religious practices in recent years. But again, if we wish to know Jesus, we have to come on a weekly basis. The analogy that I always give is all of us have friends. And if we want our friendships to develop, we have to meet with our friends regularly. Well, Jesus is our friend. He is our savior. And if we wish to know Jesus, then we must participate weekly in the Eucharist. For we hear Christ speak to us in the word, and we allow Christ to feed us with his body and blood and the bread and wine. So my invitation to those of you watching, I encourage you, if you can, to join in person in Eucharist on a weekly basis. And if you desire to go even more deeply, to even participate in daily Eucharist. I, as a priest, for the most part, probably celebrate Eucharist at least four or five times a week. And for me, it's really helped me to grow more fully in my faith life and intimacy with Jesus and also with the church, with the people of God. So it's a wonderful practice. Now, of course, if you're sick or if, say, something's going on in your life and you can't make, that's totally understandable. But we really do encourage you to participate in the Eucharist, to join in it on a weekly basis. For on that day, we give thanks and praise to God, and we allow God to feed and nourish us with his word and sacrament. My friends, next week I look forward to talking further about another sacrament of initiation known as the Sacrament of Confirmation. Know that you are always welcome here at St. Anne's, and we look forward to seeing you on Sundays. May God bless you, and may God keep you. Take care.